part of what's going on is people have been so preoccupied with not using nasty words to describe the reality over there that they've failed to actually acknowledge, actually factor into policy making the realities of what's happening there. We have treated as normal a government which wears eradicationist ethno-supremacy and ethnic cleansing as a badge of pride. Since Israel launched its campaign of bombardment and ground invasion in Gaza, the main thing I've wanted to do with this interview series is give you the context that you just won't find in mainstream media. Because one of the things that really struck me about Western media is how little we actually hear about what's going on in Israeli politics. So what kinds of domestic pressures is Benjamin Netanyahu under? What has changed since the 1990s and the Oslo Accords about the diplomatic role played by the United States? And how did it come to be that Israel basically abandoned any pretense of a commitment to a two-state solution? Luckily, we're not going to be in a state of ignorance for much longer, because joining me on this week's Downstream is Daniel Levy, a former Israeli peace negotiator whose insider knowledge of the peace processes and why they failed is pretty much unparalleled. If you're watching this on YouTube, you might be wondering why we're about to shift locations and change outfits. The truth is that after my interview with Daniel Levy, I got really excited about eating lunch and just forgot to shoot an introduction. So please forgive me. Daniel Levy, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I suppose my first question is a really broad one. Quite famously, the position taken by Ehud Barak's government was that Israel can't be a democratic state, a Jewish majority state, and also maintain the occupation. Right? There was at least an acknowledgement of that fact. Do you think that's still a prevalent view in Israeli politics today? Good to be with you, Ash. And it's, it, it's interesting you're starting with that because it takes my mind back to a place. My goodness, yes, there was a time when an Israeli leadership would talk in those terms. And, and I worked as a political appointee uh, in that government. I think, yes, that narrative still exists. However, what it translates into in terms of what the non-occupation vector on that triangle looks like, I think looks very different today. Now, that gets us into slightly tricky terrain of, oh no, does this guy think there was this golden era and they were really going to entirely end the occupation? And I think that's not the case. But I do think there was a fault line in Israeli politics around something that looked like a significant withdrawal of the occupation from the Palestinian territories. We would have had to have pushed harder, and, and I think that was a huge missed opportunity for Israel to actually do a full withdrawal, allow Palestinian sovereignty. But there was a fault line between that and entrenching the occupation. Today, that fault line looks much more like if you want to call it a Palestinian state, you can. But what we're really talking about is a glorified Bantu stand. This is the fault line is, do we maintain control or do we go the whole way and complete the project of ethnic cleansing? And I say that at a time where that terminology is, is so much more prevalent. For many of our viewers, they may have heard of the Oslo Accords, but don't know what the content of the Oslo Accords were. So I guess this is two questions, which is what was in the Oslo Accords and why weren't they implemented? Why don't they form the basis of the reality that we're living in today? Awesome, because I'm glad we're doing a 24-hour interview. <laughs> um, so this was an attempt to do something where at the beginning of a, an engagement with the peace process, <clears throat> you didn't define the end game. Okay, so it was an attempt to say, first, let's put in place 
some pieces of Palestinian self-governance, some elements of um, Israel, Israeli pulling back from day-to-day -day security in parts in kind of small islands of the West Bank and Gaza. Um, pulling back from some of its management of the day-to-day -day life and control of Palestinians, but not all of that. And setting out that these are the issues we have to conclude which would get a permanent peace deal. This is the 90s. We're in a certain place in where Palestinian and Israeli domestic politics are at, respectively. Maybe we'll come back to that. We're at a certain moment geopolitically. This is the height of the unipolar post-collapse of the Soviet Union moment. The notion that America could help see this through doesn't sound fantastical. We've had the breakthrough in apartheid South Africa. We've had the breakthrough in Northern Ireland and on the island of Ireland. So what Oslo does is it sets out the terms for the gradual embedding of a Palestinian self-government and the terms for completing negotiations. However, it also sets a deadline. Because what has to coexist during that period is Israeli occupation with elements of Palestinian self-governance. The deadline is May of 1999. That's almost quarter of a century ago, right? And what happens during that time <clears throat> is those things can't really coexist. You can't have occupation. And in fact, the occupation is entrenched. In many ways, the Israeli side says, whoa, we're taking this risk. We better double down on some of the security. What security looks like is greater oppression for Palestinians. Therefore, you're poking even more. So those things can't exist. And, and there was a choice. Either rush to the end game and actually try and get this resolved or let the thing fester. It's quite evident what the choice was. And a quarter of a century almost later, you're still trying to manage this interim arrangement, which now simply looks like occupation by a different name. So the Oslo process for Palestinians has become another modality for dispossession, stealing of land, denying of rights, far worse today than it was when Oslo was launched. A 450% increase in what we call settlers. What's a settler? This is an Israeli civilian living in the occupied territory. That's illegal under international law. You can't transfer your civilian population. Settlers don't exist as a free-floating entity. They only exist with the funding, the construction, the security military presence of Israel. So things got get worse for Palestinians. And on the Israeli side, and I'm sure we can come back to that, Israelis say, hey, we were going along with this peace process, but it didn't deliver peace. And they see their security also get worse as a consequence of, of these circumstances that are created and much harder the second time around. I mean, thinking about how domestic politics played into that interim period and between the Oslo Accords and the Camp David summit for which you basically had a front row seat. Um, how important was the assassination of the Israeli Prime Minister who had negotiated the Oslo Accords to, um, I guess, undermining dedication to that process of pulling back from the occupation, scaling back the occupation, allowing for more flourishing of Palestinian sovereignty? So first of all, I think it's probably important to acknowledge that that scaling back of the occupation doesn't really happen. It, it exists almost in theory only because what the Israeli withdrawal is out of city centers. <clears throat> However, if you're a Palestinian and you want to leave the confines of your city, you then bump up against a greater level of Israeli checkpoints, military presence, closures. Plus, the Israeli military are still going in and out of those city centers. So that 
there's there's not the feeling uh, of of this withdrawal. The Israeli Prime Minister at the time, Yitzhak Rabin, we have a negotiation, and the negotiation remains within the confines of handing over certain authorities over over issuing of agricultural land use arrangements, things like this. Um, that's called the Oslo B. That's the second big deal. Rubin completes that. It's not a particularly far-reaching. I was in those negotiations. I, I sometimes found myself sitting there scratching my head thinking, are we really nickel and diming them to death over, over this granularity of detail on something which... If this process is going to succeed within three to four years, this isn't going to exist at all. Because if this is what these tiny interim arrangements are going to be like, what on earth are we going to do when it comes to the big questions? Settling arrangements on Jerusalem, settling permanent borders, the fate of Palestinian refugees, etc. Rabin completes those negotiations. The, the street has largely been owned by the opposition during this period. There are weekly demonstrations. Um, the chap who people may uh, uh, now be familiar with his name, Itamar ben mm -hmm. who is a minister in the current Israeli government, he's the Minister for National Security, he first hits the limelight during these demonstrations as a, as a young thug um, who at one stage produces the, I can't remember what car it was, but the, maybe it was a Mercedes insignia or something, from the front of Rubin's car and say, we've got to the car, we can get to Rubin. <sighs> they're sending, they're putting out posters <clears throat> of Rubin with uh, swastika insignia. Uh, he, he's, pictures of Rubin wearing a kafia with a swastika insignia. Uh, so the, the right of owned the street. And there was this effort to reclaim the street on the part of the camp supporting this, this peace process on the part of the Rubin camp. They have a big rally in the central square in Tel Aviv. Rabin is assassinated by a, a Jewish extremist. And it does feel like an important rupture. Now, many of my Palestinian friends would say, listen to Rabin's speeches, even when he presented the Oslo B deal to the Knesset, he wasn't going to go there. That may well be true. I also think it's a little too determinist. And Rabin had gone on a journey. Not far enough, fast enough for my life, but it was an important journey. That assassination, I think, is is crucial um, in in defining that there was probably no leader to carry us through. The person who takes over is Shimon Peres uh, 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 from the pantheon of kind of Israeli great leaders, but but Peres was super reluctant to to move precipitously to say, okay, now's the moment to get this done. He slows everything down and he loses an election. The people who've led the incitement against Rabin are in power just seven, eight months after his assassination uh, when Benjamin Netanyahu is for the first time in 1996 by a hair's breadth margin elected prime minister of Israel. And Netanyahu has been prime minister for most of the intervening period. So do you think that the assassination of Rabin, that was a moment which almost kicked off a sort of mechanism of increasing radicalization of Israeli governments? It became more and more difficult to hold a position of negotiation which had Palestinian sovereignty on the table. And the momentum and perhaps even the swing of public opinion was moving rightwards towards a more hardline direction. Would that be a fair assessment? I'm not sure, because I think it's worth challenging that from two places. First of all, had enough happened already? Were there enough signs that Israel and the political philosophy guiding Israel, Zionism, could make this ultimate compromise with Palestinian national existence. Because that's quite counterintuitive to 
the Zionist movement as a lived reality in the state of Israel since its founding. There were lots of strains within Zionism, non-state centric strains, binationalist strains, cultural Zionism. Once the state is established, the modality that it puts in place has consistently demonstrated that any realization of Palestinian national rights is antithetical to that modus operandi. And so people may say, well, what, but they withdrew from the Sinai to have peace with Egypt. They've had peace with Jordan, now with the Gulf states. Those are different. The, the Palestinian question has always been seen as existential. From 1948, when Israel is established, after the mass expulsion of Palestinians, where you have just a remnant of the Palestinian Arab community, they live under a military governorate for the first 18 years of the existence of the state. So there's this... And this was the watershed of Oslo. The question, the fundamental question around Oslo was, can Israel transition into a place where it can live with, it can live alongside, it can accept Palestinian national collective existence? Perhaps the assassination of Rabin helps leave that question open because we never saw where it could have gone. Unfortunately, the preponderance of evidence is it, we haven't gone there. The other the, the reason I'd question just how much of a, of a, of a go, no-go moment uh, that was is one has this other window in, in, in 1999 to 2001. Ehud Barak wins the support of 96% of the Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel. So in addition to Palestinians who have been expelled, Palestinians who live in occupied territories, Palestinians who are refugees, Palestinians in the diaspora, you have 20% of the Israeli population are Palestinian Arab. They voted overwhelmingly for Barak. They thought this was a return to Rabin. Now, it didn't play out that way. How much that's due to the question I just raised, I, I think considerably. But it felt like a moment where maybe we could go back to that. And so I think that the, the Israeli journey to not seeing through a two-state option does have some twists and turns. Undoubtedly, the Rabin assassination being a, being a major one. It's, it's arrived at a place where it would take a really radical shift to imagine that again. Israel just experienced a huge shock, and that can do unexpected things to a system. So I'll state that thought and maybe park it for now. Well, I, want to, I want to talk about um, Barack's government and specifically the Camp David summit. But for our viewers, when I talk about here's this big summit, massive diplomatic enterprise, they don't know how to picture it. And I don't know how to picture it. If you tell me you're a fisherman, I can kind of imagine what it means to be a fisherman. If you tell me you're a diplomat or an international negotiator, I don't really know what your job looks like. Um, so this might be a silly question, but for a massively high stakes summit like that, what is it like when you enter the space? Like, how managed is it? Has an awful lot of thought gone into what stationery is supplied and the amount of fizzy water that's on hand? Is it is it that well planned? Um, and and how important are back channels? Is there a sort of official negotiation going on and an unofficial conversation going on at these things? How does it all work? So Camp David is, of course, the traditional retreat of the American president. That's where the the Israel-Egypt accords were negotiated. In July of 2000, that's where you have this, this attempted big peacemaking Israeli-Palestinian summit hosted by President Clinton and his team. I was in a back room back in, in Israel then. Several months later, the Americans actually put a plan on the table and we reconvene in Taba, which is on the Egyptian side of the Israeli Egyptian border in the Sinai. And there I'm in, I'm, I'm in the negotiation and I can, and I can uh, speak to that a little. Those things matter. The the, the dynamics you you know the, the the host will. So there are different ways of hosting these things, right? Where I was in Taba, 
the the hosting was just that. It was very passive. In fact, in the original Oslo Secret Channel, uh, and I worked with the, the people who did that Oslo Secret Channel just after Oslo when we did an, another secret channel, which didn't lead to an agreement. Um, at Tabarin in Oslo, the, the, the hosts were like, you're all comfortable? Good, you got what you need? Okay, good. You, we've given you a nice setting. You can, you know, have downtime where where you kind of have an informal walk. And Camp David was much more managed by the American uh, host and sponsor of the meeting. But probably not managed in the most important sense of the term, which is, look, sometimes parties are stuck and bringing to, the bringing together for this clinch it summit was premature. When that's the case, you have two choices. And if you have a powerful external convener, which has leverage, which can crack heads. Remember, we thought this is the, a, a unipolar geopolitical moment. America, huge leverage. You either have to say, we're going to try and push this through anyway, but then your role and your ability to carry both parties and your ability to see where are the potential meeting points and not be the lawyer of one side is absolutely crucial. America dramatically failed to play that role uh, in Camp David. Why? Why did they fail to play that role? Well, one of the one of the members of the American team actually uses the fr the phrase I just used, and later on writes, "America was Israel's lawyer." In in these, Aaron David Miller, who's a, a, a skion of the American establishment, when Ben Rhodes used the term "the blob" to describe the Washington D.C. establishment. No disrespect to Aaron David Miller. That's um, the why takes us into American politics. I think um, before we go there. The other thing you can do um, is say, okay, this isn't, this isn't going where we hoped it might go. How do we prevent dangerous collapse? And that's really relevant for, for Camp David and uh, at the risk of, of getting too much into the minutiae. They didn't have a fallback. They didn't say, okay, we can't clinch a breakthrough deal. What are the steps that can be taken to ease the pressure, to make sure that in, in the absence of success, failure doesn't look like an explosion, which is precisely what failure looked like because Camp David ends in July. Within 10 weeks, we're in the second intifada when the then Israeli opposition leader Ariel Sharon makes a provocative visit to the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque compound to the Temple Mount and uh, all hell breaks loose. So they didn't do that. Taba, funnily enough, was, um, in a way, the Israeli government had collapsed already. Uh, it was a negotiating team much more conducive to exploring concessions on the Israeli side. Uh, we didn't get there, but it felt it felt like uh, there there was seriousness. I was shocked um, at how little preparation apparently had gone into. Uh, the negotiating positions adopted by Israel at Camp David in the following way. It almost felt like the Israeli side was still negotiating with itself. And it had worked out a fabulous compromise between different wings of the Israeli government. <laughs> Just one small problem. You were actually facing a Palestinian negotiator with Palestinian positions. And they somehow thought, well, if, if, if we've got the acceptance of the moderate wing of our government, surely that's okay for the Palestinians, right? And that wasn't the case. So I suppose that was going to be my next question, which is how do you go into negotiations balancing what might be an acceptable landing zone between you and the Palestinians whilst managing domestic politics at the same time? Was there ever a, a version of either Oslo or Camp David or Taba where the Israeli government is really bringing the Israeli public along with them. I think that in this respect, the initial breakthrough is the closest we've come. And the crucial missing ingredient ever since then has been that the external envelope has failed to create the correct incentive structure. So let me unpack what the, yeah, what I is mean, but what are you talking envelope? about? What are you talking about? Uh, what's the Royal Mail got to do with this? Um, so 
the, the, the initial Oslo breakthrough comes at a moment when the First Intifada, popular mass uprising of Palestinians from inside the territories, then occupied by Israel for two decades, um, underground political factions, unions, women's movements, they challenge Israel. This is a largely non-violent popular mobilization and uprising. It, Israel cracks down as it knows how to militarily disproportionately. International attention is drawn to this. And, and it feels like, and, and people may be drawing some analogies here, it feels like uh, Israel is losing support. It feels like the world is mobilizing. It feels like there could be costs for Israel to carry on like this. It feels like they won't be able to return the territories to the easy management model that had largely prevailed for the first two decades of occupation. And as time goes by, you have an American administration. It's actually the Bush senior administration. James Baker is then the uh, national security advisor who are not okay with this. And they actually put on the table loan guarantees, a financial disincentive to Israel, which they had been providing to Israel because Israel at the time is absorbing uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of Jewish immigrants from the former Soviet Union. So you have this combination of, of pressure from the Palestinian street, pressure from the outside, and Israelis feel we need to change. I remember, this is, this is soon after I had moved to live in Israel, and the, the slogan in the 1992 election campaign, which Rubin wins and then starts the, 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 the talks with the Palestinians, actually he removes the ban on negotiating with the PLO, interestingly enough. The slogan was, Kesef l'shchunot v'lolit nachruyot, which means we should be spending our budget on working class areas, it's a rough translation, uh, rather than settlements. And that, wow, a time when that slogan worked. Um, so that was that was then. Fast forward. What I think has happened subsequently, and this is that external envelope I was referring to, what I think has happened subsequently is you have had the march towards total impunity for Israel. And, and so for me, when you say, how do you carry your public along? Yes, you have to offer them a vision of something that's better than the present. But I think something else needs to be in the mix which is there's a price for not doing this. This is exactly the thing which I wanted to um, go on to next. In some remarkably unguarded comments in 2001, Benjamin Netanyahu says, I know what America is. It is a thing that moves. And, you know, then he sort of swirled his supervillain cape and you know, <laughs> disappeared in a puff of smoke. Um, how true is it that Netanyahu has been an adept player of the Washington violin? Or is that just something that he says because that strengthens his domestic political position, but actually he's more vulnerable to American pressures than he lets on? So I think there's a very interesting question here. How much is Netanyahu just a fabulous violin player? And how much, if you kind of pull back the cloak on the Wizard of Oz, my God, he's not actually playing the violin. That violin plays itself. And I think it's it's important to think about how American politics addresses questions around Israel and has, in a way, there's been this strange journey where today you see public opinion is in one place, but the automatic violin playing is almost gone in a totally different direction. So... When Netanyahu, and that fabulous quote that you dug up, you know, and, and he says, in Hebrew, it even more comes out that, that as, as America is an easy thing to move. The, the translation is, it probably best, I, I can wrap America around my little finger. We're talking now in December of 2023, and that feels perhaps more true than ever. Tragically, perhaps tragically for the Biden electoral prospects next year as well. But um, I think to understand that, 
American political weakness, even when it looks so much like this does not serve American national security interests, nor uh, narrow immediate political interests of an incumbent administration. I think to understand that, because it is so consequential, it is so much part of the story of how, how do we get here? How do you have these ethnic cleansing hyper-nationalists at the heart of government in Israel? How do you have the devastation being wrought on Gaza without the kind of pushback that would appear obvious and necessary? So crucial to understand. And, and I think the way one understands that is by not just looking at how effective Netanyahu is. So yes, Netanyahu lived in the United States. He first kind of makes his bones politically uh, when he's a deputy ambassador at the UN and gives these great speeches in English, what were considered then great speeches, I think. Um, he does some things which were strategically important. He, he is crucial to establishing the relationship with the uh, dispensationalist evangelical Christian community, which is now the largest pro-Israel lobby uh, in America. It's 10 million strong or something like that. I think that. it's even more than that. By the way, interestingly, polling amongst younger evangelicals looks a bit different. But this machine, which is, of course, now so much at the heart of the Republican Party, means any ability to do, I mentioned the Bush senior administration, right? Any ability to do bipartisan pushback in the American national interest is, is totally neutralized. So Netanyahu is important, but I think there are factors indigenous to American politics when it comes to Israel and American politics in general, which have to be put into the mix here. And I, I would say those are three. First of all, Let's just acknowledge the shortcomings of what we call American democracy, uh, the role of lobbying. So, yeah, there's an Israel lobby. It hugely distorts the debate. There's also something called the National Rifle Association. So when we're in this country and we think, what, what another school shooting? What's with that? Why don't they? You can't understand that without the role of um, money in American politics, lobby groups in American politics. Now we have independent expenditure campaigns, um, which allow endless amounts of money, can be just from one donor, undeclared, not transparent, to be put in any race, including a primary race. So one of the things that's gone on around this 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 um, this Gaza crisis, this 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 Israeli assault on Gaza, is APAC. Uh, and, and, and the Israel lobby, and that's the traditional mainstay of the Israel lobby in America, has come out and said, we're going to financially crush all members of the squad in democratic primaries so that not a single squad member makes it into the next Congress. I, I mean, I shudder when people talk like that politically in general. But anyway, so you've got the nature of American politics before Israel comes into the mix. Included in the nature of American politics is, of course, the role of the military-industrial complex. And as far as they're concerned, what's not to like? Whether it's Ukraine or Palestine, what's not to like when, when lots of American weaponry is being used, when we're ramping up our production, when more money is flowing uh, to that? Then you also have to understand how this gets refracted through the particular lens of, the, of Israel in American politics. Um, that, yes, has to do with the lobby. It has to do with a Judeo-Christian tradition. It has to do also, though, with the stories Americans tell themselves about themselves. So, you know, Israel as a, a frontier, settler colonial society, displacing an indigenous population, yeah, that's a narrative that sits comfortably with a certain American understanding it's of like itself. Clint Eastwood playing Ben Gurion. It's a whole bingo. Type. You, exactly. And of course, what we see is that the demographic that is pushing back against this way of seeing Israel Palestine, that is out protesting, is a demographic that is fighting for racial justice in America, that is standing against 
America being that country still. And, and I've had racial justice advocates, you know, make the analogy that this feels like a global George Floyd moment. George Floyd, of course, I cannot breathe, uh, um, which really launches that Black Lives Matter movement. But thirdly, you also need to understand the geopolitics. Uh, and, and I won't go deeply into that, but Israel played a role during the Cold War when the Middle East was an area of contestation between uh, uh, America and the Soviet Union, and it plays a role today. Now, many Americans will look at that and say, actually, this is not in our in our national security interest. That has been a theme since 9-11. That's a theme now. You even have the American Secretary of Defense talking about how Israel is conducting its war in Gaza. But the geopolitics also plays into this. I mean, talking a bit about the domestic racial politics and how it plays out in this country, I feel like the story in the media sometimes is good ethnicity, bad ethnicity. So when you've got people of Muslim heritage out on the streets, that's bad ethnicity. When you've got Jewish people who are pro-Israeli because the only good ones are the pro-Israeli ones, that's that's good ethnicity. Um, and I feel when I read about how the pro-Palestinian movement is understood predominantly in British politics, it's not even about geopolitics, it's about racial relations here. How important is that for, I guess, Israel's diplomatic status, the fact that it's able to sort of tap in to narratives around clash of civilizations or which diasporas are desirable and which ones aren't desirable. Um, how important is it? Or is that just an unfortunate byproduct? Uh, it, it is far more than an unfortunate byproduct. And there's an awful lot to unpack there. So one of the places that we might want to start is how come we've had this redefinition really of anti-Semitism? How come at a time of resurgent intolerance, prejudice, white nationalism in America, in, in, in different ways in Europe, how come the focus when it comes to the well-being of Jewish communities is the well-being of a country thousand miles away um and it is very important to recognize and be cognizant of the fact that this was there was a premeditated conscious effort on the part of israel to prime the the field seed the terrain with an idea about what really constitutes anti-semitism and this came from a place which, from an Israeli statecraft perspective, actually makes sense. If you know you're in the business of permanently denying another people their rights, of running a regime of, of really quite horrendous structural violence, where you're already picking up the, the background music of, this is going apartheid, right? We're, we're, this is where, okay. Um, that's a really bad space for us to be in. How can we preemptively nip that in the bud? For you, if you can make the argument about, how dare you? What kind of animus do you have against us as a people that you would even make that accusation? If you can make that the debate, rather than your own human rights organizations inside Israel, have now reached the same determination as Palestinian organizations. Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch have now made the legal designation that this is a regime of apartheid. How do you answer that accusation, sir? You're an anti-Semite. So that's shifting the terrain of the debate. And there's an awful lot invested in that. And, and Jewish communities have changed in terms of their mainstream establishment leadership over time. And you know, when, when my parents grew up, very much in the Jewish community, in Jewish youth movements, Israel was tangential to that. When I grew up, Israel was already central to that. Today, it's not just Israel that's central to that. It is a, it is a whole narrative around Israel, my own identity, anti-Semitism. And I think what you've seen really accelerated since October 7th 
is a cohort of, of Jewish people who have said, wait a minute, this, how can we allow what is going on there to be said that it's being done in our name? This is antithetical to everything we were told was a Jewish ethic, was a Jewish humanity, was a universalist never again. And so I think the degree of outrage that one's seen in, in, in the UK from a group like Naamod, in the US from groups like Jewish Voice of Peace, if not now, speaks to that sense of, of having been marginalized for standing up to everything that we believed was, 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 was part of our heritage. Now, the, the two other things I'd say here amongst the, the myriad of things that, that, we, that we've, we've touched is um, in this country, and not just in this country, it feeds into a certain moment of, of cultural wars uh, fed by governments. And it feeds into a broader phenomenon of, of how Jewish communities are instrumentalized in debates around the Muslim community, in debates around immigration, in debates around how we look at our own history of empire, critical race theory, if you're in uh, the US especially. Um, and I think many of us shudder that, that the community is, is happy almost, is volunteering to be deployed in these cultural wars because we look at this and we say, how does this end well for, Jew, for Jewish interests? How, how is a more intolerant society where we are cut, cutting ourselves off from a broader anti-racism struggle? Just how does this, do we have any sense of our own history? How does this play out well for us when Israel is aligning with those same forces of intolerance, of xenophobia, of prejudice? Who's Israel's best friend in Europe? Viktor Orban in Hungary. Who's going to be the next best friend in Europe? Hilt Wilders, if he forms a government in Holland. Who are their best friends here? Why does Tommy Robinson march with the etc.? So that's, I think that's a, that's a really important piece of this. Do you foresee a time where the vast sums of military aid handed over by the US to Israel. One could say the arsenal of assistance. The, I would not use that word okay. in this studio. <laughs> um, it's actually a, a band word according to our editorial code of conduct written by me. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the vast quantities of military aid handed over uh, by the US to Israel. Can you ever foresee a possibility where that's used as a form of leverage to uh, curtail some of the more egregious human rights abuses carried out by Israel against the Palestinians. Because looking at the recent history of, of Democrat presidents, it seems to me that whatever they do, they get called horrendously anti-Israel or pro-Palestine. That happened to Clinton, uh, you know, in the... Uh, uh, I think in 1999, Netanyahu says, you know, Clinton is a, is a dreadfully pro-Palestinian president. Um, Obama is castigated for being anti-Israel because he makes some quite, you know, milk toast comments about settlement expansion. And yet in the last days of his presidency, he hurries to hand over tens of billions of military aid over to Israel. Um, before you get into the moral dimensions of ongoing occupation, to me, that just seems like a mugs game. This person is calling you an idiot to your face and you're handing over, you know, all of this aid. Um, will the incentives there ever change? Will there be a time where America goes, okay, we're actually more in trouble domestically for facilitating this ethnic cleansing, so we're going to start using this as leverage? Or, or are the sort of, you know, powers aligned to do the opposite simply too strong? So, first of all, we don't even have transparency. And some in Congress are now pushing for that. We don't even have transparency of what exactly the US is sending, how it's being used. Is that in violation of America's own laws? There's something called the Leahy Law, named after recently retired Vermont Senator Patrick Leahy. Is America in violation of its own regulations in some of the support it's giving? And the absence of transparency is not coincidental on this, of course. Some people say that, look, even if Biden wanted to, he couldn't stop what Israel is doing. Therefore, don't show weakness by trying to go there. I don't buy that. 
I think what you have outlined, the extent of the Israeli reliance, yes, on the military assistance that is provided and the stockpiles that are now making being made available. So when one looks at this, this the, the immediacy of what's going on in Gaza, the horrors of that, um, this isn't just shucks. Isn't it a shame that America isn't able to bring these, these parties together to stop this? America is part of this war. America is arming one of the parties. So I don't believe for a moment that American leverage could not change that equation. But what it would require is the willingness on the part of an administration to maintain a sustained standoff with an Israeli leadership, and that would have to be public. And I think that is beyond the political willingness of where the administration is at. And I say that because I don't want to say what the political traffic can bear, because I don't believe that is the case. I think that's where the Democrat voting public is at. I actually think this is going to be a, a vote loser for for Biden. I think that is where um, enough of the American public is at that you could carry that line. It would be difficult in Congress because of the things that we've talked about already. Um, but there are things that you can do by executive order if you're the American president. So you don't necessarily need the Congress. And if one zooms out just a bit further and gets beyond this immediate moment and the fact that that, that leverage could um, be crucial. And by the way, I do think that if it, this is going to come to a ceasefire, it will have to involve a greater degree of American push than we have now. I mean, you know, you have... The, the families, actually, in Israel of those who have been taken hostage, that are, uh, who are being held in Gaza, um, the, the, of the soldiers as well who are prisoners of war in Gaza, you have the families who've, who've carried a lot of that on their back and have forced this issue to the front of the agenda because either you can uh, prosecute your, your unattainable military objective in Gaza or you can get the hostages out. You can't do both. So, But, but you're going to need other things to come into play, including a greater American push. But it's not just in the immediacy. It's also this question of if Israel pays no cost or consequence for continuing these violations of international law, of international humanitarian law, uh, these policies of dispossession, structural violence vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, if the incentive structure is skewed towards why not continue with that, if there's no accountability then that has a suffocating impact on the Israeli internal political debate. It goes back to that question of how do you carry your public? You carry your public also, not exclusively, but also because there's a cost to your current set of policies. So I don't believe Israel can be sanctioned, bludgeoned into a, a, a 180 degree shift in its policy. But I do believe that without that, a more open debate, which which finally addresses choices that Israel should have to make. I don't think that conversation is, is going to happen enough if America continues. Now, just to finish, I would also step back and say, maybe that's just not possible. That's America. Understand it. Move on. The best we can hope for is that the pressure in America will stop the most egregious elements of America's role, like what we're seeing right now. But if you want pressure to be successful, if you want to introduce accountability, look elsewhere. We're in a rapidly shifting geopolitical climate. It's not the unipolar uh, geopolitical moment of the 1990s. The, the mid-level powers of the so-called global south, look elsewhere for your allies. The, the, the PLO was never allied with America. When the PLO began to accumulate some weight. It was as a challenge to the West, allied with others. So maybe we, we also uh, have to think in those terms. The Abraham Accords, which were negotiated under the Trump presidency, were widely perceived as a moment where the Gulf monarchies were abandoning Palestine. One, how true is that? And two, has that now changed since the bombardment of Gaza, which began after October the 7th? So there was this equation that said 
and it was put forward in something called the Arab Peace Initiative, which is a short document uh, endorsed by the Arab League in 2002, which basically says you can have comprehensive peace Israel with the Arab world, recognition in exchange for a comprehensive withdrawal to the 1967 lines and peace deals with all with all the neighbors. There's also this historical position whereby um, Arab states that have not had a social contract with their own public would kind of deploy rhetorical support for the Palestinians as part of their political modus operandi without actually kind of rolling up one's sleeve and doing things that are meaningful to the Palestinians. Trump administration, a Middle East where America is pivoting away, that begins during Obama, less America, uh, ideally a good thing, and a set of Middle East actors who for many years, but especially after the so-called Arab Spring, Arab Awakening, Arab Uprisings of 2011, you have some Arab states that are looking at that and saying, oh, this is not good. We don't do popular politics that is responsive to its public. And what you see in Egypt, I think, is especially Israeli-Emirati relations taken for a test drive because it's not just the Muslim Brotherhood coming to power in Egypt, which is what happens when there's a democratic election uh, by a very close vote, um, but it's also this idea of, 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 a, of a, a politics embedded in, um, in, a, in a greater social contract, in a greater public say. And that threatens some of the autocratic so-called moderate in the West, right? We call them the moderate Arab uh, states. And Israel has already set out its stall as a place that can offer you some great high tech. But it then, it then works closely to make sure that coup happens in Egypt. And then things develop further. Spyware, if you want to be spying on your own citizens, etc. Israel's very good at, at exporting that kind of stuff. Do you have any dissident journalists? If We've got enough exa for that. <laughs> exactly. Um, the Trump administration are up to all kinds of shenanigans uh, in the Gulf. Um, Jared Kushner has benefited rather well from that subsequent to being in uh, government life. They even tee up what becomes this blockade of certain, certain Gulf countries of Qatar. But for our purposes, they they managed to take this nascent Israeli-Emirati relationship, because that's the center point of the Abraham Accords. The Bahrainis are thrown into the mix, and they turn this into something that um, turns this Arab peace initiative that I mentioned on its head. And crucially, this allows Netanyahu to say, you see, the Arab world don't care about the Palestinians. The world doesn't care about the Palestinians. You Israelis were told for years that we can't control the Palestinians indefinitely. We can't do all these things we're doing against the Palestinians because the world won't let us. Well, wake up and smell the coffee. The world is with us and the Arab world is with us. So it's, it was a huge boon to Israeli extremism, these accords. Now, other states are brought in. So in, in typical Trumpian fashion, they bribe the Moroccans with recognition of Western Sahara, which they would never have otherwise got. They bribe Sudan, which that thing is still murky. And, and rather than care about the transition in Sudan after everything that country has gone through, the only way Sudan can get off the terror list and, and, and get back into the global financial system is by normalizing with Israel. I mean, what kind of a world do we live in where that's a thing? Um, so that's what the Trump administration uh, offers. However, the Biden administration continues. So rather than say, well, that's, a, that's, that's not great. That's not helping, is it? Because Israel now thinks it can get all this without, uh, without doing anything constructive on the Palestinian front. The Biden administration basically 
goes straight on, tries to bring Saudi into the mix, creates something called the Negev Forum, which brings the normalized countries together, uh, a, a particularly awfully named forum, uh, just before uh, what we saw in October, less than a month before that, at the margins of the G20 meeting in Delhi in India, they announced an Israel Middle East, sorry, an India Middle East Europe transportational corridor called IMEC. And Netanyahu, literally two weeks before October 7th, stands on the podium of the UN and shows this map of this new co connectivity, where, of course, Israel covers the entirety of the Palestinian territory as well. However, you look at all of this. And then you look at realities in Arab society. And those realities have, of course, come to the fore since October 7th. We already saw it in the World Cup in Qatar, which was after this normalization. You know, you had Israeli journalists. Morocco did rather well in the World Cup. Um, you had Israeli journalists going up to the Moroccan fans saying, but we have peace with you. And they're like, no, <laughs> not with me. And they wave the Palestinian flag because the Palestinian cause still resonates and that is what's happening today. And I think it's going to make some of those normalization efforts, even if they're done at the level of, uh, of, of leaderships, not particularly uh, feeling they need to be answerable to their own public opinion. They, they still feel that vibe. And you have the role that Qatar has played, a non-normalizing country, a pragmatic role in which they maintain the channels to Hamas, the Mossad head goes over to Qatar for the negotiation. So thank heavens you have a country that hasn't gone down that path because they can actually be useful. But in the bigger picture, um, normalization hasn't changed things. And if anything, the Palestinian cause, I would say, is more iconic, not just in the Arab street, but in much of the world today than it ever has been. Is there a big difference between the public conversation that happens in Western media about Israel and Palestine and the kinds of conversations that are happening in diplomatic, intelligence and foreign policy circles? Is there a sort of gap in reality? So one can look at that from two angles. One can look at the rather staid um, conversation that is happening in 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 much of the public domain or the quite interesting conversation that's increasingly catching up with realities on the ground um and one can also uh, do the same when it comes to what's going on in in the diplomatic domain because many of let's start with west many of the western people who are really familiar with this question who i speak to get it get it a lot more than the public statements by their most senior officials would tend to imply. But you do have now the this mantra, this narrative, and God help us, we're back to it now since October 7th. We have to go back to negotiations for a two-state solution between Israelis and Palestinians and the Palestinian Authority needs to be strengthened and they can take over Gaza. Um, what are you talking about? This is, is out of sync with, 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 with what's going on. And it kind of, at one level, goes back to the conversation we had earlier around, um, around anti-Semitism, actually. Because part of what's going on is people have been so preoccupied with not using nasty words to describe the reality over there that they've failed to actually acknowledge, actually factor into policy making the realities of what's happening there. We have treated as normal a government which wears eradicationist ethno-supremacy and ethnic cleansing as a badge of pride. And it's almost like, well, we do. Can we not, can we not talk about that? Um, that? That makes for really bad policy because then you don't know what you're actually contending with. So that, that is a, um, an important part of, 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 of what is going on. I would also say that we... We should be listening to how some of the rest of the world is talking about this. I say that, for instance, in the context of 
The United Nations General Assembly passing a resolution in December of 2022, which called on the International Court of Justice to provide an advisory opinion on the legal consequences of Israel's prolonged occupation. Why have I gone on this detour? Countries are allowed to submit their own positions to the International Court of Justice. 24 countries, including some of the most significant countries in the world, in the global south, have submitted opinions which refer to apartheid as being what as, as being the definition of what is going on. The two countries that lived under regimes of apartheid, South Africa and Namibia, centered their submissions around this. We saw at the APEC summit uh, in San Francisco at the end of November, the Malaysian Prime Minister, the Malaysian Prime Minister dressing down the American leadership over its position. So if we if we tune in to a different state messenger, we actually are hearing something different. You've had a, a, a grouping created by the Arab League and the Organization of the Islamic Conference, four Arab states, and in addition, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Turkey, who have been going around to the P5 countries. Listen to the Indonesian foreign minister, Retno, speak about this stuff. She, she makes a powerful articulation. She, listen to the South African foreign minister. Um, so we are hearing a different narrative here, but it's one that that a Western wall of, I don't want to know about this, is quite hard to permeate. And so my final question, we're speaking on... Tuesday, the 5th of December, and I'm just making that clear because news moves so quickly. Uh, The temporary ceasefire has ended. Bombing has resumed in Gaza uh, with some ferocity centered on the south around Khan Yunis. It's nearly two months since this outbreak of war began. In your opinion, from where you're standing now, what's the most likely outcome for Gaza? I just swallowed hard because the outcome for Gaza, I think, has already been defined. Um, The wholesale destruction of infrastructure and housing stock in Gaza is not something that can be reversed. The killing of over 15,000 civilians and over 5,000 children is something that can never be reversed. And and the the magnitude of that toll... um, I mean, people will probably be familiar weeks ago now already when Save the Children came out with that data point that already weeks ago, that was more children that are killed across the entire globe in all conflicts in any given year. And of course, the 1,200 Israelis who were killed on October 7th cannot be brought back. But I fear that unless we bring a quite swift, a very swift, end to what Israel is doing in Gaza and it's just entrenching itself deeper that that direct killing as a consequence of Israel's actions will now be matched with horrendous losses as a consequence of disease as a consequence of people going into winter just not having those living conditions water sanitary conditions By the way, when that flows out into the Mediterranean, it doesn't say, oh, well, just come to the edge of Gaza and now this becomes Israel and the Israeli beaches. And what the Israelis are doing to themselves beyond all the the immediately obvious things of the hate being generated for generations into the future uh, also has the mind boggle. So I fear that even if we bring this to to, to a ceasefire now, so much damage has, has already been done. And if we don't, I don't think we've heard the last of uh, Israeli efforts to try and force open the border with Egypt. People might think, well, why shouldn't they anyway? This, this would be a fabulous way out for the people. Palestinians have historic memory whereby displacement tends not to be reversed. Of course, most of the residents of Gaza, why why are we hearing the names of all these refugee camps? What's with that? Most of the residents of Gaza were forcibly expelled from what is Israel proper today uh, in the, the Nakba, the Palestinian catastrophe during the founding of Israel between 1947 and 1949. I also I think many of those people will say, do I 
when I talk about return, is that to that refugee camp, was, which was my temporary place of residence, or is it return to where my family or myself uh, originally come from? So I think the, the Palestinian-Israeli expanse has been burst open, actually. Um, I think for Gaza, this is going to be an awfully long period of real difficulty. In the broader question, I think is right now we are on this cycle of very zero sum. How can Israel live alongside Hamas? How can Palestinians live alongside a country that doesn't ban an eyelid when it kills 5,000 children? Either you or us. How does that come back to a place where we can address the injustice that has been the reality for Palestinians under Israeli domination for decades and at the same time acknowledge that the Israeli Jewish presence is a permanent one. And what kind of a dispensation, what kind of, 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 of living under equality, whether in two states or one, and partition I think has, has, has also encouraged this mutual dehumanization, much as non-partition seems a hard thing to wrap one's head around, it may be what's necessary. How does one, one come back to that? That, amongst other things, will require stepping back from the abyss, having a Palestinian leadership, which we haven't talked about and we won't, but which can articulate a, a strategy that breaks out of the trap of Oslo, challenges the status quo, and speaks for the Palestinians in a more unified voice, it will require an Israel which understands that this kind of behavior is not cost-free, even if our expectations from America and the West when it comes to pushing that are limited. And I just hope that the disruptive nature of the moments we're living through at the moment can create new dynamics because you know, this is hell and and Palestinians will not live in security with this kind of an Israel, but Israelis won't live in security also if Palestinians continue to have their most basic rights denied. And that's just a fact that we're going to have to wrap our heads around. Daniel Levy, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Ash. Good to speak to you.